Uh, good morning. Uh, this is Dominic Carosa, the CEO of Crowd Mobile. I'm here uh, and joined uh, with Christian Shaw, our CFO. Good morning. Uh, what, what we'd like to do over the next 25 minutes is take you through our full year results presentation for financial year 2015 and uh, basically take you through. We'll use the presentation announced to the ASX on the 31st. We will use the page numbers as a way of referring to a specific page or particular section, which will uh, basically guide our audience. And uh, as I mentioned before, feel free to uh, send through questions. And we've already started receiving a number of questions. So uh, basically keep on uh, sending those through. So really at a, at a highlight, um, as some of you would know, we backed or listed onto the ASX in January this year. Uh, so we've only been uh, running as a listed company for well under a year. And then we dual listed on Frankfurt uh, a number of months ago. Our revenues on a uh, FY15 basis uh, have grown uh, by over 30% to 13 million year on year. Uh, you'll note a statutory EBITDA loss of 2.8, which very much reflects the backdoor listing costs and the share-based payments. And really what is, I think, most important on an underlying basis, we achieved an EBITDA of 2.1 million excluding share-based payments. The, the focus of the last financial year has been to grow uh, a number across a number of countries. We're now operational in over 25 countries. Uh, if I look back 12 months, we were operational in only six. One of our key metrics is message growth, which is up 68% year on year. So in FY14, we did 3.4 million questions. FY15, 5.7. And there's a couple of slides in uh, we can go through and, and talk a bit more about the quarter on quarter growth. And we also launched some uh, new offerings, including Crowd Butler. Uh, in terms of shares on issue, currently 85 million shares. And based on when we at least uh, released this report, we were trading at 31 cents. I think we're trading at about 29 last time I checked. So a market cap of just over 20 million with cash at bank as of the 30th of June. In terms of the shareholding, it's broken down by roughly 25% board and management, uh, one other shareholder, a gentleman called Danny Wallace from DSAH uh, owns 20, roughly 25%, and then the other 50% is roughly free float. Uh, the business is broken down into two core areas. Uh, one is M content, which we, which you can basically say it's mobile content. We leverage an M payments network. Uh, we're connected to over 60 carriers globally, and we'll talk more about that uh, shortly in regards to why that is important, particularly why it's going to become increasingly important as we move into Asia, Africa and Latin America uh, around um, certain markets where there's a large proportion of the market which are basically classified as unbanked. They do not have a bank account and basically their mobile phone is really the, um, the core, uh, the core um, way that they can experience content and pay for things. And then the other division is mobile commerce, uh, spearheaded through our newly launched Crowd Butler service, and we can talk more about M Commerce shortly. Uh, in terms of how we make money and how we get paid, uh, this gives an overview in regards to M Content. So we effectively sell content through mobile carriers globally, uh, as well as through Apple as and Google. Uh, through Android devices and obviously Apple devices. And this just gives an overview in regards to the splits that the telcos typically take, which is roughly 50%, Apple 30%, and Google 10%. And it should be noted that the revenue that we report, so the 13 mil revenue is net revenue. It's net of the telco, Apple, and Google taking their cut. Uh, in terms of M commerce and the way that we make money from an M commerce perspective is to effectively take a, club, a click clip of the ticket. And so, for example, if you were to ask Crowd Butler 
which is currently launched in Hungary and it's currently uh, in beta in the UK to please deliver me a pizza, uh, please deliver me some beers. Uh, Crowd Butler will basically take a cut of that particular transaction. And uh, I can see some questions coming through from Mark and Selt and Stella. We will address those questions as uh, as time goes on. So please feel free to continue sending through those questions. Uh, this is just another example of how we can also leverage our apps uh, to leverage e-commerce revenue. So in, the, in this example, where we actually provide some fashion advice and we suggest, why don't you look for a mint colored necklace or scarf uh, the next iterations of those apps will allow people to click and then buy directly and will be able to take a, a cut of that particular transaction. Uh, the next slide is, uh, in my perspective, quite an inter interesting slide. Uh, it looks at the message growth on a quarter, on quarter basis um, and uh, we've had good solid growth. We expect that trend to continue uh, moving forward particularly, and the key drivers are, one, as we launch into new countries and establish a greater um, a network of end payment capability, it, what it does when we move into a new country, it will expand our addressable market. Uh, and then we are continually looking for new products to push through uh, and, in effect, increase our ARPU on a, on a customer basis. So that's really the, the two ways that we can continue increasing our message volume on a quarter by quarter basis. Uh, in terms of our p and uh, I'll maybe uh, hand it across to Christian to give a bit of an overview in regards to our p and um, June 2015 compared to June 2014. Sure, thanks Dom. So as Dominic has already said, our message volume uh, has grown by 68% from 3.4 million to 5.7 million in uh, the year ended June 15. Our revenue is up 32% uh, from 9.8 to 13 million. Our gross profit up 28% from 6.5 million to 8.3 million. Our statutory EBITDA is down 240% um, from 2 million profit to an EBITDA loss of 2.8 million. And, and Dominic spoke a little earlier about uh, the reasons for that, but we can go into that in a minute. The underlying EBITDA uh, is 2.1 million profit uh, for June 15 versus 2 million for for 14. Uh, so that's uh, pretty constant or up 4%. And our NPAT is a loss of $4 million compared to a profit of 1.1 million, which is down near 500%. The reasons for the underlying um, um, movement in our profit um, are shown below on this slide. And we can see here that there was a $3.1 million share-based payment impact in the June 15 year for the acquisition of or the reverse acquisition of Q Limited. Um, that's a, a little bit of an unusual accounting treatment but um, the accounting standards require us to in fact uh, book that cost through the P&L. Um, transaction fees, cash transaction fees for the reverse acquisition of $0.3 million and share-based payments for incentive plans for staff and directors, which is a one-off cost for the listing of $1.1 million. And that that in effect reflects our increase in full-time equivalent headcount uh, from 12 to 51. Um, and then also the track concepts transaction fees of $0.4 million in the June 15 year. So overall, significant underlying adjustments which take us from a loss of $2.8 million statutory EBITDA back to an underlying EBITDA profit of $2.1 million. Yep. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, one of the questions that we have um, is, if you could please comment on the lower um, GP in the second half or FY15, uh, compared to FY14. Sure. And uh, and so if you can just give a bit of an overview in regards to that, please, Christian. Yes, yeah, sure. Look, our, our gross profit margin uh, declined to 64% in FY15 from 66% in June 14. Um, and so I guess that, that 
whilst the decline is is small, n no decline is welcomed. Um, and of course, that reflects um, our changing mix of countries that we are um, pushing into and, and that we generated our revenue and our gross margins from in the June 2015 year. And um, whilst there aren't particular margin pressures in any given market, um, in fact, quite the opposite. Uh, we think that in the individual markets, the gross margins are actually likely to lift, if anything. Um, our overall blend of countries that are generating the revenue for us means that as we go into some countries with lower um, unit economics, our overall gross margin is likely to um, trail off a little bit, um, but we don't see it as being that as being a significant trend. Uh, and certainly, um, you know, this year by, by by comparison, you know, we don't we don't see much margin erosion at all. Yeah, and uh, thanks, Krishna. It's it's certainly worth noting that when we move into markets in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Uh, the buying power isn't as strong and, and we use the Big Mac index as part of our pricing strategy when moving into a new market. And, uh, you know, for example, a, a Big Mac in Australia is, you know, around the $4 mark. Uh, you go into some of the other markets that I've mentioned and it's around the $2 mark. And, uh, and so from that perspective, on a blended basis, as Christian mentioned, we would expect to see a, a small decline, but overall in terms of gross dollar contribution, we would expect to see increases in you know, running a public company uh, and having you know, 51 FTEs, there would be a relative um, fixed cost base. And, uh, and as you can see on an underlying basis, we're already generating uh, po you know, positive EBITDA. Uh, moving forward in regards to the balance sheet and cash flow, I'll hand it across to you, Christian. Sure. Um, so 30 June, uh, cash on hand was $1.8 million. Uh, total assets 7.2. Uh, we have we had minor a minor debt balance of of 0.2 million dollars, which um, is a carryover from when the company was a private company. Um, total liabilities of 4.6 million, net assets of 2.7 million. So again, growth in all the right areas, um, um, albeit uh, we're still relatively um, small with our balance and skinny with our balance sheet. Um, do you want me to talk about the cash flows as well? Yes, I do. So, so we talk about the, the cash flows, receipts from customers, $12 million, payments to suppliers and employees, uh, 12.2, uh, net operating cash outflow of 1.1 million. And look, that compares unfavourably to the June 2014 year, um, albeit that it should be noted that we are investing heavily in working capital on our balance sheet. Um, part of our business model is that um, we're paid out from aggregators um, uh, as between seven and 120 days after the end of month. And so as we grow, as our sales and our revenue uh, increases, so does the investment in working capital. Um, and hence the reason why our operating cash flow is negative. Um, one of the ironies of, of, the business that, of the business that we're in is the more aggressively we grow, the higher value of, of working capital that is uh, invested on our balance sheet. So. Of course, it's about uh, maintaining uh, sensible growth rates in that regard. Our net investing uh, cash flows was actually a positive 0.2 million, and, and that includes the net impact of acquiring half a million dollars of positive cash from the Q limited reverse acquisition. So in the absence of that, it would have been 0.3 million negative. And the net financing cash flows were was 2.1 million positive. The net movement in cash from the previous year was 1.2 million positive. Um, Christian, one of the questions I've got uh, from Stella is, uh, does the company envisage further fixed cost step up in financial year 16? I think the, the as Dominic alluded to earlier, um, certainly moving from 12 to 51 FTEs um, is the biggest step up that we're likely to see you know, for the next few years. Um, that's a relatively stable uh, fixed cost base, um, albeit that we are expecting uh, a step up in costs for Crowd Butler, which is a, a new business initiative that we announced recently um, and something that is very deliberate um, and that will um, 
be a cash drain in FY16 for the group. However, with regards to the crowd mobile uh, core um, AQA business, the, the costs, the fixed costs are relatively stable and will only be minor increases in FY16. Yeah, and, and it's worth noting, as mentioned in the Cloud Butler uh, investor deck that we released not that long ago, uh, we have already had interest from groups out of Europe to invest directly into the Cloud Butler business. Uh, it's a new business unit for us. It will actually require some investment. And one of the options that the board is currently assessing is to look at third-party investment directly into Crowd Butler, and it's a UK uh, domicile company and group. And you know, there was a number of strategic strategic reasons why we did that. Uh, so without wanting to and, and really being able to get into more detail, uh, it suffice to say that the board is obviously looking at all options in order to be able to um, grow Crowd Butler without dipping into our own cash reserves. Uh, moving on in terms of slide 11, uh, won't spend too much time here, but there are a number of macro factors that are impacting our business in a positive way. Uh, obviously, the adoption of smartphones uh, is a real benefit to our business, as well as global DCB direct carrier billing volumes increasing. And direct carrier billing, and as you'll sort of note in the next couple of slides, just allows customers to add the cost of their content of the service directly to their mobile phone. And this is really a, a very a low friction type payment method. And it allows people in countries such as Asia, Africa and Latin America, where typically the, the penetration of credit cards is in the single digit, so typically less than 10%. And their mobile phone is really the way that they can uh, acquire product and get it billed directly to their mobile phone. So we see significant growth in direct carrier billing. Uh, slide 13 really looks at the global end payment network and how that operates. I won't um, spend any time on, on this particular slide. And maybe just taking a step back, uh, the way that we will continue growing Crowd Mobile, one, from an organic perspective, continue building out our end payment capability. Uh, not only in Europe, but in the, the other three continents that I've mentioned. Uh, we've set ourselves a, a, an internal target to be active in 100 countries uh, in the world by the end of 2016. And that basically means that we need to be working with telcos, uh, with mobile operators in each of those countries. And in fact, we had a number of people in Asia and Africa and Latin America over the last quarter visiting a number of telcos and starting to build those relationships. Um, secondly, in regards to uh, growing the company, we are obviously looking at our acquisitions, Track being the most immediate acquisition which we will get into and speak about because I know a number of the questions relate specifically to, to Track, which we will uh, address in a moment. Uh, and so in, in regards to um, organic growth, um, as I've already mentioned on slide 15, number one is to grow our end payment capability. Uh, secondly, is to acquire and then integrate new businesses and new products and then cross market. And uh, we made an announcement earlier um, last quarter in regards to Crafty, which is a new product that we're about to launch. And once again, that, uh, that product launch is imminent. And then continue expanding third party partnerships, which, I, which I've already mentioned. Uh, in terms of track concepts, uh, we announced the transaction with TRAC uh, in June this year. Uh, it's a purchase price of roughly $36 million up front plus some kind of earnout. out. Uh, TRAC uh, owns um, specialist technologies and end payments. They are already operating in 38 countries across Europe, Latin America, Asia and Africa. And there's another slide that gets into a bit more detail. They're very much a, a leader in the end payment space. And so it not only makes strategic sense, and as uh, Christian will, will speak about shortly, it also makes sense from a, a revenue and an EBITDA uh, perspective. In terms of where we are up to uh, with regards to the transaction, uh, we have now completed all of our due diligence across, across legal, technical and financial. Uh, as announced to the market, we have secured a senior debt term sheet for 9 million euro, which is roughly 14.2 million Australian dollars. 
We are reviewing a number of mezzanine funding providers and other alternative providers, which we will update to the marketplace. Um, in fact, we've got a number of term sheets, well in excess of 20 million, which we are currently negotiating and that we will announce to the market in due course. Uh, with regards to the share purchase agreement, the SPA, um, that will be executed um, very shortly. Uh, I won't give a specific time frame other to, than to say uh, it's you know, just around the corner uh, imminently. And um, in terms of timetable, it's pushed out a, a little bit in regards to um, the original end of August. Uh, we now expect all the financing for the acquisition to be completed by the end of September. And Christian and I are actually headed to Amsterdam the first week of October in order to complete the acquisition and to start with the integration process. Uh, in terms of pro forma financial 15 uh, financials, uh, over to you, Christian. Sure, thanks, Dom. So just um, to re-emphasise, these are pro forma FY15 numbers, 30th of June numbers. So what you can see in the left-hand column for CM8 are numbers that we've already gone through. And just to note, the EBITDA is an underlying EBITDA number. And the track numbers are provided for the same uh, year, 30th of June year ended, based on an average exchange rate of 69.6 um, AUD euro. On a combined basis there, we can jump straight to it. I think the revenue, 43.1 million. Gross profit, a touch under 25 million. And the EBITDA, almost 16 million Australian dollars. So I think, as, as Dom alluded to earlier, it not only track not only makes sense from a financial point of view, but indeed is very exciting uh, for Crowd Mobile uh, from a financial point of view, and and, and quite quite likely a game changer. Yeah, um, Christian, if you can address one of the questions from Stella, can you please give some colour around Track's operating performance in the June 2015 half? Uh, constant um, yeah. on a constant currency basis which you may, may not be able to do on this particular webinar but if you can maybe provide some color uh, if any sorry just clarify the question is it is it with regards to the June half versus the prior half is that the question? yeah I, I, I that I, that's the general question okay so it's getting into a little little bit more level of detail but the the June half the six months ended June 15 um, was actually up Versus the versus the prior six months um, in the in the in the low double digit percentages, and both on a revenue basis and then uh, uh, less or so on an EBITDA basis, um, and the reason for that was was primarily cyclical. Um, track has um, a big revenue month in the month of of December and January particularly. Um, and so it was up and confirming the revenue and the EBITDA were both up for the six months ending June 15 versus the six months prior ending December 14. Thank you, Christian. Um, we have a question from Ivan. Uh, how long will the integration take and what sort of integration risks are we looking at? Uh, is it a straightforward integration and will track under Crowd Mobile be the same entity I no redundancies. Um, if I can maybe ad address that, uh, in regards to the integration, we would expect we're going to be a running it as a separate company uh, with a separate management team. Uh, having said that, both Christian and I, as well as our, our European-based chief operations officer, will be effectively moving across to Amsterdam and spending most of our life uh, out there over the next six to twelve months. Uh, in fact, I'm actually moving my family across to Amsterdam for most of 2016 uh, in order to be, be as close to track and the action in Europe as, as possible. Um, we've already identified an, a number of risks and contingencies around that. There was, they were outlined uh, in the track original presentation. Um, we haven't included this in this particular deck, but feel free to refer back to our June deck where we outline the key risks and the mitigation around each of those risks. And no, they, there will not be any redundancies. Uh, Track uh, has about a dozen people in the company. In fact, 
uh, as I've already mentioned a number of times, our objective is to grow track, grow its internal capabilities. So in fact, we will be hiring people um, within that business in order to uh, put it into a position where we can grow it much stronger because uh, we see, as you'll be able to see on the next slide, uh, this is slide number 19. Uh, if both crowd and track were combined as of today, uh, we would be in 30 European countries and it would represent roughly 70, 73% of the total revenue. And where we can see the real growth is in Latin America, Asia Pacific and Africa. Um, we would expect over the next two to three years where our total European revenue contribution was to decrease over time and revenue contribution from the three other continents to increase over time. However, having said that, the total countries to continue growing. Um, we see there's significant opportunity in those new markets. Uh, as I mentioned, we had a number of our team in Asia as well as Latin America and Africa over the last quarter and we see some real greenfield opportunities uh, in, that, in, those particular, in some of those markets. Uh, and uh, yeah, so we're, we're very, very positive with regards to the potential growth ahead. Uh, moving forward in regards to um, the, the synergies, and uh, this slide was, was previously uh, announced, but it will effectively more than double our countries available and more than double the mobile operators or telcos that we operate with, uh, as well as making significant improvements around um, the number of languages of our products as well as the number of key products as well. So there's some significant opportunity in regards to um, you know, synergies across the group. Um, and we're not really focused on cost synergies in the sense of we're not going to go and retrench anyone. In fact, we're going to be adding people um, because I think there is a big opportunity to continue adding more products, more markets, uh, cross-marketing, because a number of the countries that Crowd Mobile is in, Track is not in and vice versa. So there's some real low-hanging fruit around taking advantage of, uh, of those synergies. Uh, moving on to the uh, the next slide, slide number 21, in terms of the peer analysis, maybe I can hand it across to Christian to provide some overview. And and uh, please feel free to continue sending through those questions. We uh, we really like those questions, so keep them coming through while Christian focuses on slide number 21. Yeah, sure, Dom. Um, so, look, this is a, a peer analysis that we pulled from our what we think are our closest uh, uh, competitors or, or peers on the Australian Stock Exchange. Um, it's, it's reasonably self-explanatory, um, but what we should do, or what I, what I feel uh, obliged to do, is to emphasise um, the multiples that uh, CrowdMobile uh, is operating on, and particularly a revenue multiple of two times and an EBITDA multiple of 13 times with a market cap of approximately $25 million. Um, you'll note, that compared to our closest peers, um, our multiples are somewhat less. Um, and to our who we think is our, our closest peer mobile embrace, um, we're, we're starting to approach similar multiples. Uh, uh, they're, they're trading at 2.5 times revenue or 16.5 times EBITDA. Um, and some of the others are a little bit a little bit less directly comparable, but their revenue multiples are significantly greater and they don't produce profits. So I think the important uh, thing to glean from this particular slide is that uh, if we are, are able to, to maintain our, our revenue and EBITDA multiples um, post, post completion of track or indeed be re-rated uh, incrementally and, and achieve higher multiples, then the implied market capitalization for a post track completion would be significantly different to where we are today. And by significantly different, I'm talking about approaching uh, 10 times. So definitely this track acquisition from a financial point of view um, is exciting. Um, and we certainly look forward to um, uh, maintaining our multiples and having a significantly greater market capitalization and, and being more, more formidable in a, in a pure financial sense. Yeah, I think it's worth noting, thanks Christian, that 
where the company's been listed for less than nine months. So we are very much considered the new kids on the block. Uh, part of what we'll be doing over the next couple of quarters, particularly once we've completed the track acquisition, is to do a roadshow, uh, not only in Australia, but also um, post, uh, also in Europe, um, where we are dual listed on the Frankfurt Exchange, and that's one of the strategic reasons why we effectively listed uh, on the Frankfurt Exchange. And we would expect uh, that over time, uh, particularly once the track acquisition is complete and we're talking you know, well in excess of 10 million EBITDA, that we would then be on the radar of the, of the small cap and micro cap institutions, both here and, and offshore. And uh, we would think and hope that our you know, revenue and EBITDA multiples would be closer to our peers who have been listed for, for much longer on the, uh, on the ASX. Uh, in one of the other questions that I've got um, from Brian, we, and this focuses on track, and um, will the lead generation aspect of the track business be a new element to the combined business, and can crowd leverage this rather than using third parties if it doesn't already have this internally? And can we add some savings to, to GP and increase the lead quality? So um, while I'm just touching on that, uh, Track works with a bunch of affiliates globally in terms of acquiring their customers, while Crowd Mobile uses uh, social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, in order to acquire its customers. So there are some significant synergies with regards to the groups being able to cross market and cross pollinate uh, not only um, you know the, the different groups that we're working with, but also the internal intellectual capital, the know-how of Track combined with the know-how of Crad Mobile, I believe will be a very powerful uh, force. Um, one of the other questions from Stella, uh, could you please comment on the post-track combined company's currency exposure, please? Yeah, look, the, the, the most of Track's revenue um, and, and of course cost base is in Euro. Um, so um, there is, of course, um, uh, an exposure uh, when uh, bringing back into AUD. Um, at the moment, um, given that the currencies are moving in the way that they are, uh, it's a positive in a, in a, in a um, reporting sense. Um, uh, Euros are increasingly worth more and more, and, and accordingly the revenues and the profits um, are appreciating uh, when we bring them back into Australian dollars and report them. Um, we can't say that with, with certainty, of course, that that'll always be the case. And um, so there definitely is uh, a foreign currency exposure there. And it's something that uh, within uh, the treasury aspects of our finance uh, and broader business, we're looking at um, moving forward. Um, it's not something I propose to go into any detail on, but it's certainly something that's on our on our radar. Yeah. And, and I think it's also worth noting that, um, you know, Crad Mobile in its own right, over 80% of the revenues are derived from offshore, both in Euro and GBP. In a way, we, we maintain a natural hedge whereby we actually pay our people in Euro and GBP as well. So in effect, there's a natural hedge um, already in place. But that's something that, as Christian mentioned, we will uh, continue uh, reviewing. Uh, just moving forward, uh, really in summary and, and closing off, unless there are some further questions that, that, that are going to come through, uh, you know, Listing on the ASX was certainly a, uh, a big milestone for the company after being private for a number of years. And for those of you that have gone through uh, the uh, annual reporting detail, you would note that the last few years of it being a private company, Crad Mobile actually paid fully frank dividends to its shareholders. Um, not that we are anticipating that for Crad Mobile in a listed sense uh, over the next 12 or so months, but the reason I, I speak about that is um, the company has been in a position in the past to pay dividends and it's something that the board will certainly continue uh, looking at moving forward in the future. Uh, one of the questions that I've also got from Mark is, can I talk about the new apps and products coming online? Um, I can't talk about specific apps coming online other than to say that a number of announcements with relation to launches of new apps is imminent. Um, and we will announce those in, you know, very sh shortly. So yes, there will be a range of new products uh, that we will be releasing over time. 
And really, in summary, we will continue growing the company, um, no operational in over 25 countries, and we'll continue uh, towards our goal of, of 100. And uh, in terms of growing revenues by 32% year on year, uh, once again, we would expect that trend to continue. Uh, and given that we've got a fairly fixed cost base, you know, there's, there's certainly some leverage, operating leverage in our model. Um, now, because we're about to wrap up, any final questions, please continue sending them through and I'll maybe just, um, John uh, asks a question, can you comment on Track's cash flow position, level of cash flow generation from operational activities? Like, and I, I think what John's asking is uh, in terms of EBITDA to operational yeah, sure. cash flow, if you, if you can provide some colour around that? Yeah, sure. Look, they're, they're, I'll talk about their free cash flow and their free cash flow, meaning their, their operating cash flow less um, their investment in, in uh, fixed assets. So effectively, um, capacity they have to, to service uh, debt or pay dividends, um, which they have been doing um, as a private company historically. So Trax um, has, a, has a, a high uh, proportion of its uh, EBITDA turning into free cash flow. Um, some of the due diligence activity that we've done noted it um, uh, at approximately 70%, um, which is uh, reasonably high. Um, and that should be noted as being after uh, paying corporate income tax. And the corporate income tax in the Netherlands is 25%. So you can do your own maths pretty quickly there and determine that, that their EBITDA translates, albeit in time, uh, to cash flow. Uh, quite handsomely. Okay, thank you for that, Christian. Well, uh, I'd like to thank everyone for their time on this webinar. Uh, it has been recorded uh, for those that haven't been able to make it, so we'll be, we will be making it available online um, very shortly. Uh, we'd like to thank all of our shareholders for their continued support. Um, we see significant opportunity for the company uh, over the next three to five years. We're very excited about the real opportunities on a global basis and uh, we'd like to thank all of our shareholders for their continued support. Thank you.